This week on Young Rock, Little Dewey spends a day with a giant, Rocky's family loyalty is put to the test, and the Island Battle Royal ends with a royal disappointment. We're talking Young Rock Season 1 Episode 6 on Pro Wrestling Repackaged. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us again. My name is Chris. And my name is Tessa. And this is Pro Wrestling Repackaged, where the squared circle meets the small screen. This week, we're discussing Season 1, Episode 6 of Young Rock, My Day with Andre. And you know something? Since we started this podcast, it seems like The Rock has just been seeping into our everyday lives. (laughs) You know, my nephews. I have little nephews and They're obsessed now with both The Rock and wrestling. In fact, I just bought one of my nephews a birthday present, which was this playset that comes with a wrestling ring and a John Cena and The Rock action figure. Yes, they're still selling those. (laughs) They're still selling those from that WrestleMania all those years ago. I don't even remember what number it is, but it's astounding to me that kids getting into wrestling in 2021 are still gravitating towards The Rock and John Cena. Now that has a lot to do with you know, their parents and who they introduced them to. And of course, my dad introducing his grandkids to wrestlers he's familiar with. But I'm just so surprised that The Rock continues to just be this omnipresent figure in wrestling, even when he has nothing to do with it. I think The Rock and John Cena, too, they just have this massive star power. You know, John Cena's got a new show coming out. The Rock's always in a million different things. So they're just always there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Cena has a million projects coming out. He's got the Suicide Squad. He's got the Peacemaker show. He's got that Wipeout show. I'm sure he's got a million other things. But yeah, he's another one of those omnipresent figures now, even when he's he has nothing to do with the current product. But The Rock especially, I mean, Cena's heyday was a lot more recent than The Rock's. And we still go into the store <laughs> and and still every time we go into the store, we see rock action figures and other kinds of toys and items in every store. You went to the store the other day and both times you sent me a picture of some little stupid toy of the rock that yeah. you saw. It's yeah. like he's haunting us. Yeah, I was at Walmart and there's WWE brand wet wipes with the rock's <laughs> face on them. Then I was at Dollar Tree and there's little miniature action figures and The Rock is the main one there. It's nonstop rock. Yeah. There's also that damn energy drink (laughs) that he's just peddling nonstop on social media that I refuse to mention any further than that. We are not here to shill his his horrible energy drink, whatever it is. We don't know if it's horrible. Energy drinks are all bad. (laughs) And if you drink them, you should probably stop. That's my official stance. (laughs) And with that, it is now time for this week's edition of The Rock Says. The Rock says, The Rock says. What's The Rock saying? Tessa, why don't you kick it off? So my quote is from Little Dewey. When he is talking to Andre the Giant, he drops some waffle wisdom on him this week. And, Turning the table. <laughs> and he says, what if the problem isn't that you're too big for the world? It's that the world is just too small for you. Very touching. Yes. That's uh, that's Adrian Gru's Oscar bait scene or <laughs> Emmy, whatever it is for would TV. Have to be, would have to be Emmys yeah. or, or Golden Globes. A cute friendship and some very nice interactions between Matthew Willig as Andre and Adrian Gru as Little Dewey. And of course, we will discuss all of that. But for my quote, <laughs> I went with a good old Rocky Johnson quote. <laughs> it's when Atta is playing him the song that she wrote and he's all excited and he goes oh this is your rocky shuffle (laughs) the just the fact that he equates (laughs) he equates things in other people's lives to it being their rocky shuffle i just loved he's so supportive in this episode (laughs) i love supportive supportive husband rocky johnson supportive of atta's musical endeavors So with that, let's dive into the episode, Young Rock, Season 1, Episode 6, My Day with Andre, directed by Jeffrey Walker, written by David Smithyman, Smithyman, (laughs) Smithyman, David, (laughs) Tessa, why don't you give us a summary of this week's episode? So in this episode, we return to 1982, where Dewey wants nothing more than to see E.T. in the movie theaters. 
But instead, he ends up spending the day with Andre the Giant, feeding pigeons, and learning some big lessons. At the same time, Rocky's loyalty to Leah is tested when Greg Yao returns and tries to poach him with some grand promises. And the big battle royal for Peter Maivia's vacant title ends in a screw job due to Leah catching Rocky in what she thinks is a double cross. Meanwhile, in 2032, The Rock finally reveals his pick for vice president, and it's someone the press is a bit surprised by. (laughs) There were so many aspects of this episode that I really genuinely enjoyed, but there were also some aspects that I was a bit disappointed in, and I think it's safe to say that you agree with that. Yeah, there were some aspects that I felt were pretty weak. The overall episode, I think, is still solid and fun, but there are some things in there that it's like, really? Why are we doing this? I think we did have some really great moments, though, and some moments that I had been waiting for Mm -hmm. since the first episode. And we'll, of course, discuss all of that in detail and break it all down. But, you know, this episode really did give us the payoff for quite a few story threads that have been set up in the prior five episodes. Greg Yao and his (laughs) offer to Rocky Johnson, the big island battle royal that we finally got to see, Atta's musical endeavors and her quest to get on Star Search, and... Of course, as we mentioned, The Rock's running mate, which we will jump right into. The Rock's pick for his running mate and the 2032 scenes in general. This is, of course, as I predicted, you know, not the most uh, not the most out there prediction because we knew she was cast and she I, hadn't shown up yet. But the debut of Rosario Dawson as General Monica Jackson. I was really pulling for Stephanie McMahon there. <laughs> Yeah, well, at least she would have been able to give a little bit more of a speech than General Monica Jackson did. Yeah, like there was all this buildup and Monica just kind of says, hi, thank you. Shout out to Daryl. Yeah, Yeah, this, this introduction or lack thereof, this was a little bit puzzling to me. We know nothing so far other than that Entertainment Weekly character synopsis for General Monica Jackson. And what The Rock said in this episode, we really know nothing about her. So her coming in and she has this presence and she comes in and she looks like she means business. She's this, you know, decorated general. Right. And she comes in and she kind of just chokes under the pressure of having to make this speech. And, you know, she says she's not really good at public speaking. I'm just a little bit puzzled as to the direction here. You know, because it got a chuckle, but I felt like this was pretty weak. The 2032 stuff as a whole was just really disappointing in this episode. You know, I mean, they're introducing this idea that The Rock wants a running mate who disagrees with him on some things. I mean... Challenges him. Yeah. I mean, she she previously endorsed his opponent, Senator Taft, who I assume is a descendant of former President Taft. And the press even says that Monica said that The Rock's remake of Matilda lacked the necessary violence to be entertaining. They don't have equal viewpoints, though that tells me she's a war hawk. (laughs) Yeah, she's I guess she's the trench bull in this situation. (laughs) So I get what they're trying to go with here, but I don't think it was executed well because we don't know anything about her. We weren't introduced to her at all previously. Right. And they may salvage this in the coming Mm -hmm. episodes, but I was just a little underwhelmed, especially with how excited I was that she was involved. They did a movie together at some point. Oh, they did? Early in The Rock's career. I forget which one it was, but it was one of his early action movies. Mm -hmm. So it is nice to see them together again, but really I thought that they could have done literally anything other than just having her just kind of stand there and then The Rock fill in with his shoehorned in stories at this press conference that... (laughs) It just doesn't seem to always make sense the way they have The Rock kind of go off, you know, drifting down memory lane. I think the Andre story this episode made sense, but everything else, I think, was kind of just a reach at best. But is that intentional? Well, yeah, that's what I wonder. I mean, it feels like they're grasping at straws to make these connections to 2032 and 1982. I mean, what does the screw job have to do with? The Rock wanting someone who's going to challenge him. And why is he weaving this story? And how is he weaving this story into a press conference? If I was the journalist there, 
how annoyed. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? What are you giving us here? Yeah, I feel like this scene was really missing at least one journalist who would really just be like, okay, all of this aside and really just start to press him. But either this is some sort of a statement on the climate in 2032 and that celebrities in the White House and in political office have just become such a commonplace thing at this point that they're not even phased by it. They're all just kind of enamored with this cult of celebrity that is Dwayne Johnson being, you know, one of the biggest stars ever. So they just kind of go along with it. And this is just business as usual. I really want to see someone challenge him. I I don't know if it has to be, you know, a journalist, someone he's talking to when he's being interviewed or, you know, when we finally, I assume, meet the other candidate. Yeah. How how are we going to challenge him? Because it just seems a little extra ridiculous this week. This felt more like a Comic-Con panel than yeah. <laughs> a political press conference. So yeah. I'd, lo- I'd love to see a debate and how he handles that. Yes. Because, I mean, we know The Rock is a great, you know, public speaker. His his running mate is not. But I, I do feel like this scene would have been better if... Our man Randall was here to get the exclusive. Yes, the lack of Randall was not something that I was super (laughs) enthusiastic about. We speculated, would Randall get the exclusive? And he did not. And I'm just a little bit like, okay, this could have just been made better if he was at least there in the crowd, you know, and had some quips. This could have at least been maybe salvaged in a way that would have maybe gotten more laughs because in the end, this is a comedy. Right. Awkwardness aside of that segment and kind of The Rock just coming in with his ridiculous shoehorned in trip down memory lane, I didn't really laugh at any of this. Right. I think 2032 is mostly only entertaining when Randall is there. Yeah. And I think there could have been some funny bits between Randall and Monica, who are both kind of awkward on camera. Because, you know, we see Randall have these difficulties on live TV. Yeah. So I think there could have been there could have been something more. And maybe yeah. maybe it was just a, a scheduling thing. Maybe they couldn't get Randall Park to just be in the press junket. But I think it would have been a lot stronger if they had. Right. And just overall, it just felt like a misuse of Rosario Dawson. But again, they still do have a number of episodes to come. So we can see a little bit more of that character of General Monica Jackson. But let's move over now to young Dewey in 1982 in Hawaii. and. Kind of his main storyline this episode, again, removed from the actual meat of the episode, but a nice storyline in its own, and that is A Boy and His Giant, Young Dewey and His Day with Andre the Giant. Here we have Dewey. He wants to do kid stuff. He just wants to go see E.T., but Atta and Rocky are both busy. We'll, We'll get into, you know, more of that, what they're up to. So Andre offers to watch Dewey for the day but he refuses to take him to the movies. Yeah, at first. <laughs> at first. At first, which was, I was like, oh man, are we not going <laughs> to get to see an, a scene of them watching E.T.? Because that was immediately something that I loved about this episode was the excitement around E.T. Because, you know, it makes sense. It's 82. Right. E.T. was a cultural phenomenon and still is. And that's a movie that it's like, there's magic there in that time. And I wish I could have been there to have seen that when it came out and experienced that excitement. So I like that we got a little taste of that in this episode. I also like that we got a little taste of another cultural phenomenon in this episode, which we will get to. But I loved the excitement around E.T. But at this point, I was kind of just like, oh, man, are they? is it just the one-off reference? But again, they did make good on that. They did. But you have Andre say that he doesn't like movies. He prefers books. So he's real classy like that. That's that Frenchman. <laughs> he's just being he, he he's just being a, a a hipster before it was a hipster thing, I think. He has an even better plan than movies. He wants to feed pigeons. <laughs> yeah, and that's where we get Adrian Gru and Matthew Willig's uh, Emmy bait scene here <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, the metaphor of the biggest pigeon. Everyone mm-hmm. shoes him away. Everyone thinks he's greedy, but it's Andre's favorite pigeon because he, re- he relates to the pigeon and, you know, a cute little storyline, a nice moment and a moment that clearly, if this really happened, made an impact on little Dewey's life mm-hmm. and something that followed The Rock throughout his life. We know that he did have a close relationship with Andre and he referred to him as Uncle Andre. So whatever the case, whether this is just fictionalized reality or 
if it's something that actually did happen. Mm -hmm. It's a nice depiction of a boy and his giant, that kind of trope, but making it personal to actual people who existed in the real world and may have had many, many days like this. Yeah, and I felt like Andre's stuff was some of the best parts of this episode. I think he's really funny when he's talking to Dewey. I I liked seeing that bond because I think we expect to see, you know, the bonding between Dewey and Ada and Rocky. So it's nice to see him have these just special one-on-one moments with the wrestlers. I also really enjoyed him calling Rocky Columbo because of the way he was dressed. (laughs) Don't arrest me, Monsieur Columbo. (laughs) Yeah, I think we had another Columbo reference at a point earlier in the season, but always enjoy a nice Columbo reference. Great show. We mentioned earlier Rocky being the supportive husband and his support of Atta's musical endeavors, and that's another story thread that we got a continuation of in this episode, her audition for Star Search and the choice of the song Gloria by (laughs) Laura Branigan. Now, before we dive into this, I just have to say personally that I was delighted by this. I love Laura Branigan. I love that song. Self-Control is my favorite Laura Branigan song, personally, and one of my favorite songs of all time. But Gloria is a certified banger, and I would be hard-pressed to find anyone who disagrees with that. So I love that we just got that just smattered all over the show. <laughs> what I found funny was when Rocky asks Ata what song she's going to do, and she's like, Laura Branigan. And he just gives her this <laughs> look. He doesn't know, because that was me. I wouldn't have recognized that name either. But, you know, it's the hottest song of the summer. I would suspect that many people wouldn't recognize the name Laura Branigan unless you're maybe a diehard music fan from this era. And for me, this song was on the radio still all the time when I was growing up. And I think a lot of other people had that experience of listening to not oldies radio at that point, but listening to radio that would play songs from the 70s and 80s. And you would just hear songs like Gloria and The Power of Love, not the Huey Lewis song, (laughs) another great song though, and self-control all over the radio. So that's how I kind of just by osmosis got Mm -hmm. to know some of Laura Branigan's bigger songs. So I was very happy to see this. But Everyone else had the same idea as Atta here as we see a scene of her in the recording studio and everyone is recording a version of Gloria. (laughs) Yeah, so she starts to doubt herself. And again, this is where we have supportive husband Rocky. She says, how am I supposed to stand out when I'm singing the same song as everyone else? And he says, well, if you want people to remember you, you got to show them something they've never seen before. And so he starts encouraging her to write her own song and record it because that's going to be something that stands out. If everyone's singing the exact same song, someone doing one thing slightly different is going to be a game changer. And we do see her writing the song Mm -hmm. with her ukulele. And some of the lyrics she incorporates are things that she said to Dewey earlier in the episode. Mm -hmm. So a little tropey again. Yeah. But it's a nice scene. And we actually got to hear Stacey Lay Lewis singing voice again Mm -hmm. in this original song. I don't believe that it was her singing Gloria, but it definitely was her, she confirmed on Twitter, singing this original song. I think she sounds really good. It kind of is like, you know, we're surprised by the actors with the wrestling scenes. You know, they're really exceeding our expectations. I think the same thing with, with the singing. Yeah, they all really do rise to the occasion with whatever skill is required of them that episode, which I think tells you how well they nailed the casting for the show because they're all very, very talented and skilled people. So that was really nice to see and hear. And again, it's it's another instance of just how much you fall in love with The Rock's parents Mm -hmm. on this show, both of them and their relationship at this point and how supportive Rocky is of Atta and her endeavors. Meanwhile, he's got his own kind of internal struggle going on. You mean finding the right outfit? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's uh, he's dealing with uh, putting together his Columbo cosplay. <laughs> but but his struggle, of course, as we saw in the prior 1982 episode, is Greg Yao's offer to him to leave Polynesian Pro Wrestling and to come join Greg Yao's promotion. And we see in this episode Greg Yao trying to woo Rocky Johnson. Yeah, he's been successful up to this point. He got King Kong Bundy, Junkyard Dog. So it kind of feels like Rocky Johnson will be a shoe-in. He's promising him the world. He gives him a gold chain that says number one and tells him that 
Rocky, you're going to be my number one guy. You're never going to lose a match. You're going to be my champion. And that's really what Rocky wants, you know, because we saw him in the last 1982 episode stressing because he wasn't Vince McMahon's top guy like he thought he was. He just really wants someone to, like, give him this chance to shine and be the top guy. And Yao's offering it to him with probably more money than what Leah can give. Yeah, you would have to imagine. But in the end, it's that family loyalty. And we saw a nice scene earlier in the episode between Leah and Rocky that, you know, he has this pride in being able to kind of take over where Peter Mayavia left off. Mm -hmm. And Leah's very proud of him, which brings us also to kind of Leah's whole story this episode. She's prepping for the Battle Royal. We get that great booking meeting for the Battle Royal, which I loved to see. And I saw (laughs) someone in the hashtag as we were live tweeting just saying, you know, oh, seeing a woman booking a wrestling match just gave me so much life. And that's another great thing that I think that this this show can give a platform to is, hey, look at this badass booker in the 80s and it's The Rock's grandmother. Yes. Now, The Rock talks about this in his book. He says that it was his grandfather's dying wish for Leah to take over the promotion. And he talks about how involved she was because, you know, it could be really easy for her to just be just the company figurehead. But she was incredibly active. She was in there with the guys, you know, going over everything, even though she's, you know, older at this point. Yeah. You know, she's, she's not young. And it wasn't ever her responsibility before. So here we get to really see her just take control of this promotion. Yeah, she's even doing media appearances to promote the Battle Royal. She goes on Terry and the (laughs) Chief radio show or just the Terry show, as Leah says. I loved how much shade she gave to the Chief, (laughs) this, this goof here. But Leah really being out in force all about promoting this Battle Royal. She's got the match booked cold. And we see how that comes to fruition later. But before we get into kind of the controversy and, you know, the whole spectacle of the Island Battle Royal and the aftermath, I just want to give a quick shout out to Bob. (laughs) Because Bob is quietly one of those show stealing characters and him being Leah's henchman this uh, (laughs) this episode. (laughs) I loved it so much. I love Bob. Go get the car. I, I, I like that he's the Cato to her green hornet, which a reference that completely goes over your head. Hopefully, I don't understand. Hopefully someone appreciates it. But I just I love that. I love Bob busting down Randy Savage's door in his hotel room. Yes. And then I, like running away. <laughs> yeah. Just wanted to mention how much I enjoyed Bob this episode. He was he was really one of the highlights for me. That brings us to the Island Battle Royal. Yes. Hold on to your butts. <laughs> Why didn't The Rock uh, use that as one of his catchphrases? I think that would have been great. Would have been great. (laughs) Just imagine the t-shirts, the the merchandising (laughs) possibilities. No. (laughs) So we mentioned the booking meeting and the plan for the Battle Royal was that Peter's championship will be on the line in this match. And no other wrestler has held that title since he passed away. It has been vacant. Right. So it's going to be a big honor to whoever she chooses to win this title. And in the end, she decides it will be Rocky because he's been so supportive since Peter passed away and since Yao has come into the picture. And he has been very loyal as well. And we see that Mm -hmm. in that he turns down Yao's offer. And steals his boots. And steals his boots. We see that at the very end. And that's not revealed to us going into the Battle Royal. But Leah happens to oversee Yao and Rocky having this meeting at the restaurant. This is where one of the things that I was a little bit disappointed comes into play. Her catching Rocky, first seeing the boxing gloves hanging from his rear view mirror in his car, and then looking and seeing him sitting down with Yao. And it's almost like one of those classic sitcom comedic misunderstandings that wasn't comedic, it was played as dramatic. Yes. So it's just an instance of characters not communicating with each other and making rash decisions based on a misconception, which is something that I really, really am tired of in TV shows and movies. And I was a little bit disappointed that it went this direction. I understand they want to add a little drama and intrigue, but it it's just something I was like, okay, all right, it's a little bit overdone. 
Now, I'm like Andre the Giant, in which I read a lot. (laughs) I read a lot of books, and this is a very, very common trope. You know, and it's always used for dramatic effect, but it always, always, always makes me mad. Because it's not necessary. All Leah has to do is go to Rocky or go to Atta, go to somebody and say, hey, I saw you with Yao. What's going on? Exactly. This is family. It's not just some random guy on the roster. It's yeah. her son-in-law. It's it's the father of her grandson. Why would you want to create a rift? And she has the opportunity to communicate with him right before the match yes. in the locker room. And she lies to his face mm-hmm. and still leads him to believe that he's going to be winning the title tonight. So what a shock when the battle royal takes place exactly as she booked it out, mm-hmm. except for the finish. Right. And this is where I had some questions. (laughs) Okay. Because, so we saw in the booking meeting, the Wild Samoans are the ones who are eliminating the Iron Sheik. They throw him over the top rope. That's the plan. So in the actual match, he goes through the ropes in between. They throw him. They know how he's going. I assume they know that that's how he's supposed to go. It doesn't look like he just moved himself. No, so, he, he he couldn't have. They right. intentionally threw him between the ropes and yes. not over. Now, this again, this is family. This is Atta's family. They're very close with Rocky. Did they know that he was being screwed? Because in the end, you know, he Iron Sheik goes und, goes through and he comes back up at the end after Rocky believes he's won and everyone else believes he's won. And Rocky has to throw himself over the top because Leah changed the finish at the last minute. So who all knew about this? Either everyone was in on the booking plans, you know, mm-hmm. Afa and Sika and Sheik, mm-hmm. or Sheik in the ring calls the audible to them right. because he is now aware of the new booking plans and says, I'm going over, throw me through the middle rope. Or is it a situation where it was discussed with the Wild Samoans beforehand and they were just operating under the assumption that Rocky Rocky knew? knew. Because I can't imagine them knowing in advance and not telling him. Right. Not going up to him and be like, hey, you know, I'm sorry to hear that Leah's changing the finish. So there's either something sketchy going on with them or they're just, you know, clueless. (laughs) I hope that's something that they do follow up on in the next 82 episode. The fact that it went the screw job yes. route, and there is so much good about this battle royal that mm-hmm. it it, it, did, it did not taint it for me. But screw jobs are just one of my least favorite subjects in wrestling. I never need to hear discussion <laughs> about the Montreal screw job ever again. I just I never need to hear it again. I don't care. So to see it here, while I was really really enjoying this battle royal, it kind of was a little bit of a disappointment. But I understand. From a writing perspective, they needed to add this element of drama, I guess. Sure. It is a comedy. Right. But you need to have stakes. Sure. I just hate this trope, the miscommunication. Yeah. I just, I really hate that. And and I do wonder, though, how the 1982 episodes are going to look going forward. It does have me really curious about that. How How do Rocky and Leah move on from this? Do they? Does Rocky leave? Is this when he says, I'm done with your promotion? I'm, you know, I've had it. You screwed me. I'm leaving. I'm your top guy. And you're doing this to me over the Iron Sheik, (laughs) who they already established. Who am I going to put the, who am I going to give the belt to? The Iron Sheik? Look at him. And, you know, it's, it's been well established that real life is not necessarily the guide for where we're going with this story. This is a, a fictional take on real life events, but not all the events actually are rooted in something that actually happened. They're not based in the truth. They're just kind of loosely based on The Rock's life and his family's life. So I think there's a definitely a lot more to come with Greg Yao sure. and the whole extortion issue and the extortion charges for Leah. And that's based on real life events right. with another promoter. So that will definitely be a big aspect still. But the Rocky of yeah. it all, where that lands, it's definitely intriguing for right. <laughs> this this <laughs> version of the storyline of the show, because we have so many other storylines that we're following. <laughs> but the way they kind of went about this, and this may be an unpopular opinion, and mm-hmm. totally, I, I, I get it. Like, it's just, my personal taste is that I would have not preferred to see 
characters with the opportunity to communicate and clear the air, but they don't. I would have preferred not to see that. And you're on the same page with me on that. And this is a situation that's going to affect everybody. Like I've said, their family. How does this affect, how is this going to affect her relationship with her daughter, with her grandson? Because it's not, like I said, it's not just some random guy. There are consequences. Right. This was, for me, a bit of a a sour taste from a really great episode in a battle royal that I was totally enjoying. And that's why I kind of wanted to end with the praise for this Mm -hmm. battle royal, because I thought the way this was presented was fantastic. Yes. We're introduced to a couple new guys in Ricky Steamboat and Sergeant Slaughter. We finally get to see them uh, show up. Yes, Sergeant Mm -hmm. Slaughter actually being played by a wrestler out of Australia named Maniac Wayne Matei, I'm assuming. It's it's very similar to my last name with T's instead of F's. <laughs> so Maniac Wayne Matei portraying Sergeant Slaughter and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat being portrayed by Ivan So. I think they did a very good job mm-hmm. in their spots. We saw Ricky Steamboat in the pilot, I believe, when Ro- it's the clip of Rocky Johnson giving him a drop kick. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering where that would come in. And here it is. And I was very glad that we got to this because this was the scene that I was kind of waiting for Right. since we got this show. This was really my main hook into the show was we are going to see portrayals of this period of wrestling on a mainstream NBC sitcom. I'm very curious because we know what that can look like from a show like Glow. Yes. And I think especially with Chavo Guerrero being involved in this show as well as Glow, I think there was a lot of not overlap, but maybe similarities between the depictions of televised wrestling from the 80s. And that's not a bad thing at all. I really thought that any influence that this might have taken from Glow was definitely a positive because I thought that this the camera work and the editing, I loved it. I love whenever they switch to that four by three shot and it looked like. An old it looked like an old show. televised wrestling match. I thought it was great. I could just watch that scene over and over, I think. that's That might be my favorite scene thus far of the show. If they recreated this entire wrestling show <laughs> and put it as an episode, I think that would be worthwhile. And like you know, Glow did. Yeah, and you talked about the similarities to Glow. I also think that something might that might have influenced that is the use of music in this scene. Yes. Gloria returns over the wrestling match. And that me- very... And let me just say, Gloria by Laura Branigan playing over a a (laughs) clips of a wrestling match is something that I never knew I needed. I was always a fan of wrestling music videos that you would find (laughs) online in like the early 2000s. But Gloria, I had never thought to throw Gloria over a wrestling match. So, So to see that, it just was, I was just in a total state of bliss watching that match. I think it's a fun juxtaposition of styles, too. Yeah. This heavy pop 80s song over these beefy men going at it. <laughs> like, it's just, it's funny. But I also feel like it would have also been great in Glow as well. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> it would have fit really well there. Definitely a fan of that. I just, I am over the moon for this battle royal. And finish aside... I am such a fan of this battle royal. This was worth the price of admission. I mean, (laughs) we didn't pay for this. But (laughs) if we had, if this was a streaming show and we signed up to a streaming service just to watch this show, I would feel that I have gotten my money's worth based on this episode and this sequence in particular. I think that if you show this to any wrestling fans that haven't watched the Mm -hmm. show thus far, I think they would at the very least say, okay, that's really cool. Chavo's work with this team is so good because they're supposed, they're just actors and they're supposed to be professional wrestlers. Whereas with Glow, there was a little leeway where they could look bad because none of them were professional wrestlers. Yeah, they weren't They They weren't weren't supposed to be. Yeah. But because you have all of these actors who have never stepped into the ring ever, they've never wrestled. Except for Sergeant Slaughter. Right. And they're able to do this and make it look so good with the short amount of time that they had. It's just incredible for Chavo. (laughs) Yeah. Towards the end of it, I had to remind myself that I wasn't just watching wrestlers Mm -hmm. do this. Yeah. I was watching actors doing a really good job with Mm -hmm. no stunt people. Right. Working on this and a very short time frame that Chavo had to choreograph and work with them on all of the physicality. Bravo. Yeah. Chavo Guerrero is the person to go to For sure. if you are starting a wrestling related show Where and you're you going to that. have wrestling yeah. sequences. And 
another thing that I really wanted to highlight was how this is being depicted now in 2021, mm -hmm. how we can get a scene like this on, on a mainstream sitcom and how, you know, the depiction of 80s wrestling versus when we watched that 70s show yes. for the bonus episode, the week that Young Rock was off. And if you haven't listened to that episode, definitely check that out because it was a very good time. But the depiction of 80s wrestling, it's Rocky Johnson wrestling little people. And it's very, very stereotypical and very kind of broad comedy. Whereas it's something like this. This is it, real. It's kind of like if you're a comic book fan and you had like Batman 66 on TV and now fast forward to 21 and we have the Arrowverse and the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all the shows that are within that now and like Netflix Marvel shows. The difference just between the way Batman 66 was depicting superheroes and the way that they're depicted now, it's kind of the same thing in the way that the mainstream mm -hmm. depicts wrestling back then. And that wasn't even that long ago. And now how it's become this accepted form of entertainment. And I think, I really think Glow being as good as it was. Sure. I think shows like this owe a lot to Glow in that respect. I think in a comedy like that 70s show, it's really easy for wrestling to kind of be portrayed as the punchline. But, you know, yeah, since Glow and now with Young Rock and what I assume we're going to see with Heels, it's kind of respected. And it is the centerpiece yes. of, of these shows right. now. We are seeing actors pulling off wrestling matches, granted, very choreographed yes. and very heavily edited. Sure. But in the bits that we do get from these sequences that they filmed, it all just looks seamless. That and they have these characters down. They they are portraying these real life people and their gimmicks at the same time, and they're doing it incredibly well. Yeah, they're all very strong. You buy that the Wild Samoans are the Wild Samoans. You buy that Randy Savage is Randy Savage. He even gives a nice elbow drop. <laughs> like, I'm just such a fan of the way that this was shot. Yeah. And obviously the finish comes into play here and Iron Sheik coming back in and telling Rocky, hey, I'm going over. Change of plans. And then throwing Rocky out and the Iron Sheik wins the championship here. You can just see the disappointment mm -hmm. on Atta's face, on Dewey's face, and Leah just looking... Kind of smug. Yeah. Because she says, I double-crossed you before you could double-cross me. Yeah. She's really proud of herself for getting one over on him. Her yeah. son-in-law. Something interesting that I wanted to note here was... The Sultan's WWF theme started playing. And now, granted, the Iron Sheik did use this in his later years when he was the Sultan's manager, but I more associate this with the Sultan and also Tiger Ali Singh. He also used this theme. This is, a, I believe, a Jim Johnston original. But just the fact that this was the other notable needle <laughs> drop in this episode for me was, was very funny. I never expected on an NBC sitcom to hear that that great guitar riff. It's a great theme. It really is. But it's more associated with the Sultan and Tiger Ali Singh for me, Iron Sheik. I think he did use it maybe in later appearances like the Gimmick Battle Royal. Right. But the Sultan, by the way, for those who don't know, is Rikishi. So another tie-in <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> Family. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess they did it for The Rock. <laughs> what was the closed caption for it? It said... Something like funky rock guitar music wasn't playing. It, was it moody? Moody. Moody. It was moody, moody guitar rock, rock guitar <laughs> music playing. I'd be really Im impressed with whoever was doing closed captions if they said <laughs> the, the Sultan's WWF theme starts playing. <laughs> but yeah, a lot happened this episode. A lot of story threads being revisited. I'm definitely interested to see mm -hmm. where this all lands with the screw job, with Rocky and Leah. Definitely very interested to see where Star Search uh, yeah. <laughs> comes into play for Atta, if it does. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the next 82 episode for sure. Yeah, and you have to imagine that the repercussions for what Leah just did come into play in all aspects of Rocky's life. Here he had a chance to be a champion. That could have changed things for him. That could have changed his complete trajectory in the wrestling business. So that could come into play in 1987, in 1990, you know, in addition to 1982. Well, we'll have to wait a few weeks to see 
where everything lands in 82. At the next episode, if the pattern, if they keep to the pattern, should be a 1990s episode, which mm -hmm. I am also very much looking forward to because the 90s are, I think, both of our favorite time periods yeah. so far. So I'm really excited to jump back into that. But that's going to do it for this episode of Pro Wrestling Repackaged. Thank you again so much for listening. We really do appreciate it. Join us next time as we discuss Season 1, Episode 7 of Young Rock. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PWRepackaged and email us at PWRepackaged at gmail.com. Subscribe on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. And visit pwrepackage.crd.co for links to everything. If you'd like to support the show, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or any other platform that features reviews. Pro Wrestling Repackaged is a Multitrack Minds production. Visit multitrackminds.com for projects and audio production services by yours truly. <laughs>